All right, well, welcome to week 10, another week in self-isolation. Uh, so hopefully all of you are doing well and have found a way to make sense of the last lecture, which was um, a focus on what we hadn't yet finished with the torso, which was really just moving into the arms. So we did the trap, the lat, and we also did what was the third one we did? Trap. Oh, Terrace Major. All right, so um, because you'll be working on homework soon, just wanted to go through this one as a way to review and make sure you, you know what I'm looking for and what I think is the most effective way for you to, to learn in terms of uh, trying to draw these. So this will be more of just a, a demonstration or application of the things we already talked about. And there's going to be nothing new in terms of the general setup. I'm going to focus mostly on the upper torso, just because that's uh, where we've left off. And since we don't have an opportunity to, to draw together anymore in class, this is uh, just a good way to make sure we're all on the same page. If anybody does want feedback um, on their homework, please let me know and I can make a video like this specifically for your your work otherwise it's hard for me to like draw on homework as I normally would and then you know return it to all of you I'm still uh, like by scanned copies I'm still grading everything I'm happy to let you know your score or where you stand you just have to send me an email so I'll be trying to do more things like this just as a way to review and and make sure that you're able to watch a drawing being done so that you can double check it maybe against your own work and and make sure you're going about it in a, a similar way. So here's my head, neck, rib cage. Because uh, I'm doing more of a concentrated study on the muscles, I'm not doing the same in terms of like the whole gesture, the whole figure. It kind of started out more part to part here. So here's the pelvis. Uh, this is the body's website still. None of, uh, well, unfortunately, you're probably going to have a hard time accessing it now that none of you are on campus. Um, so that might be difficult. But if you're, there's the Line of Action is a website that has good pose reference that maybe some of you have already used. And that might be an, a good alternative. But I was going to say that this is renewed again for another year. So if you are if you are having a difficult time getting onto the site and you are on the IP address for campus, you, sh you should be allowed on. So putting the scapula, the arms aren't up enough to have this raise too much. So I'm going to leave this inside border as parallel to the spine. And then same thing here, but I'll foreshorten it a little bit just by thinning. So that triangle is not going to be nearly as wide. Please make sure also you're keeping up with the, the revised syllabus I sent because there uh, have been a little bit more in terms of the workload added to compensate for the idea that we won't have an in-class final. Here's the arm. So this is going to be important moving into today. So first thing, let's start the way that we normally would. Basic idea of the cylinder for the arm, the direction, the degree in terms of space, and then I'll look for where the deltoid ends. So like see, we talked about the deltoid and it ends halfway down the humerus, so right here. It also only goes to the outside. So if I just look at that, I see it ends here, that's where the, the little tail ends. That means this is the outside plane. So if I just drop a line that hits that point, now I know this is the outside. And that from there, this is the back. As I moved, or if I were to turn here and then under, that would be the inside. And then that side or up here would be the front. So we have to be able to find those planes. This is something you should start adding to your um, arm or construction lay-ins. You could have also mapped or kind of used where the light and shadow shifts. And so it's about the same place. That's a good way to find the elbow right, or the corner of that arm. 
but you want it because muscles sit on each plane and then this has the um, unique anatomical ability to be able to roll right, in space so it can move that way that's a really god-awful arrow so it can go so let's give that another shot it can go this way or it can go this way so that's that idea of medial and lateral rotation that we talked about the chest is a part of now and teres major is a part of too so here's the chromium is the box clavicle is the ball goes this way so this one goes away from us where the other one was coming toward us so it looks like this and then deltoid where is the deltoid ending that's like right there so similar placement or maybe I'll just reference the shadow and that gives me about the same element or quality of de de turn so this is going to be probably the hardest part especially for those of you that kind of struggle with understanding or visualizing perspectives. Okay, uh, so let's start with the muscles we talked about uh, and see if we can build some familiarity with them. One of the ones we did last week was the traps and we built a dagger shape for those. So if I'm going to do those or use those for homework, I'm going to map. Maybe you could start with the insertion origin points. So it goes here it goes onto the top so go like that that's where the handle of the blade is it goes about a third of the way down and then you may have caught on the lecture that I said it could go from the fourth to the twelfth vertebrae it just depends people vary here uh, it's more common that it would go lower so let's put it there and that's where the point of the dagger would be now let's map it and each area in between is either going to get a C or an S, whether it's stretching or pinching. So I look at the his right side and that looks like it's pinching. So I'm going to focus on developing the handle in the blade. And then as this neck is turning and the shoulders raising, it's causing this to pinch. So that's a C curve. When it ends, it's going to go across the acromium inside, jumps the corner. This scapula is pushed back a little bit too so that means that the inside is getting a C curve as well so if you look like right from right here down to this area that's a big C curve and so that's a bit if you see you can start to kind of indicate um, lightly but otherwise it's going to come down like this and then all of these inside lines are moving with the volume they're going around the rib cage this side is stretched more. So come back to the top. This is an S. So come big S from here all the way down there. And it's going to end in the same place. Goes or attaches three surfaces clavicle, acromium, scapula, down, and then same. So the only thing we've left out is that little jewel in the handle, and that's this space. So that's the opening of the muscle around the seventh cervical vertebrae. So it's right here. And then that's the part, uh, dagger, pers the placement, where it goes, how it takes on a gesture, and the last is the perspective. So the biggest or the widest part of the muscle, the most depth, is in the shoulder and the neck. So like here you can see that there's a clear plane, there's um, half tone or light and shadow moving in this area, and that there's also a, a pretty significant or noticeable play of volume around that area. You can see the shadow rolling. So I describe this as a cylinder, and then maybe like the part of the trapezius that's going into the scapula as a, a ramp or as a, could also be a cylinder. This part thins a lot more, so here I would just start to think of how all of the muscle striations still follow the rib cage. You still move around, but in this, they're stretching more. In this, they are not. They are pinching. So maybe more of a C curve to these.
and then you don't have to light anything in this class but if you were going to that's where the corner shift is and so we'd start to see how that changes the way that value or surface falls all right so that's done one way we could double check and we talked about this was if you have a hard time with placing use the scapula the trapezius trapezius and the other side scapula and that's going to give you some kind of m just a reminder for landmarks and what everything should look like around there and then let's work our way down into the latissimus first thing is though the terrace major that's good to start here because we want to separate it from the lat so terrace major goes here to the front about a third of the way down so this is the line of action it's the pathway that this muscle is moving it goes from back to front again that's helping you just to, to medially rotate your arm or rotate your arm forward that is this shape so you see it's a big shape there's even like a cast shadow that moves across it and it's separate from your lat so that's the place I'm gonna put a big kind of cigar shape over it like a bloated cigar shape that's terrace major it goes under and then there'd be that little triangle space left open from the deltoid so deltoids up here this is the medial head and that would be going where we placed it halfway down the, the humerus here so this would be the back of the deltoid this is not empty there's just very flat muscles this is your infraspinatus and um, terrace minor but I'm not asking that you learn or draw these because they're very small terrace major is this second big shape but the reason I talked about the gap is look how it's in here it's in shadow and it's just because it's a flatter surface it's a flatter surface that doesn't get a lot of form effect with light because it isn't uh, predominant it's not a form that sticks out and catches light easily this side would be the same thing it's just all in shadow here but I wouldn't be interested in homework, you drawing shadow. I'd be interested in if you can design these with line to show space. So it look like that. So one, two, and then the very last one that we studied was the lat. And that was starting down here. So in between the spinal erectors and the oblique, right, there would be this little gap. So on either side, you could place them there. It's kind of at that peak of the pelvis the ilium as it turns and so for here it's going to the top of the humerus almost at the absolute highest point so like right where the head of the humerus is the lat goes there but to the front also so it would be a line that in this case is stretched because its job is to pull the arm down so it's going here under the terrace major all the way up and then connecting here to the front. I'm going to take it away because it's on the other side. So here's a big S curve. Remember its attachment is on these ribs back here too. So it kind of catches there and then tendon as it pulls down. So I want this always to go right underneath the terrace major over and then under the trap. And that leaves this window which is where your rhomboid would go. So just leave that empty. It's another triangle that you should leave open. Remember how useful all the triangle fossas are in our body. They're great areas to can push a feeling of realism. And so just leave a window, window there. Just like there's a window triangle between the deltoid and the terrace major. And then on this side, same thing. So the part for this one was um, the chalice, the placement is top of the arm to the pelvis in the back. The perspective is this top part is the easiest place to find a perspective and I wrap it to the back of the rib cage. So if your rib cage is this egg, you would just favor it around. And that's really the easiest way to find a perspective for it is to give it a wrapping line at the top. So it has to go under the trapezius it goes up here so it's going to overlap 
so it gets a wrap and an overlap and then this is always going to be a little bit wider than the rib cage in men just at that area so now it's on the rib cage flows down and attaches and then this area kind of between is the like if we think of the chalice this is the tendon so these muscles are kind of tied together across and on top of the spinal erectors which are the cylinders here and that was the torso right so we have upper which is all devoted to the arms and their movement and then fifth rib down which is all devoted to the kind of stability and maintenance um, or positioning and movement of your core rib cage against your pelvis okay so that's a bit of a reminder stuff that we we did and worked on last last week or week nine uh, so now let's jump into the lecture itself uh, and just go through three so I'm not gonna I'm doing my best not to overwhelm you again with the amount of, of muscle or information so this is everything we've done but again turn down um, there's darker colored uh, versions of each or of the last lecture that's on canvas just as a JPEG but we're gonna talk about three shapes those three shapes are going to be the bicep. So let's could write them down here. Just to lay everything out beforehand. Bicep, brachialis, which is just Latin for humerus, and then tricep. These are the three shapes that you have to know to be able to design the upper arm in a convincing way. Um, I'm going to start with the biggest and then work to the smallest. So that means that we're starting with the tricep and then moving to the bicep as the last muscle because it's the smallest. So one thing that's good to remember in terms of thinking that is if we imagine the arm from the front, like in this view, we would see, or it's a good visual or perspective solution to think of the arm as a gold bar that broadens as it gets towards the back. Right? That's how a gold bar would look. This is what your upper arm looks like from the front. Your bicep is really thin. It sits on top of the brachialis, which is a bit wider. And then the back of the arm is widest, and that's your tricep. So everything is progressively getting wider. Where I think most people think the opposite. They think biceps are huge and then the triceps are like these smaller things that you may see on the back. So same approach for each one. Let's jump over here and take a look at the back of the arm. So we've done this much. Let's put in a, a better idea for where the back of the arm would sit. Here's my rib. This is my humerus. And then for setting up the, the tricep, I need a few things. So first thing I want to show is I need to find my landmarks around the elbow. So this is the funny bone. That's, so that's a triangle. And then you have to find the lateral epicondyle, which is this curved surface here. Remember, those can always turn. So it's going to be up to you to make sure that you're vigilant and always try to find where those things are at. And then it would also be really useful to find where the ulna is. And so if the arm is straight, or if your arm is extended, your ulna is inside or kind of nestled in the pocket of the humerus, right? because there's a hinge joint here. If your arm bends, you'd see the funny bone and then the lateral epicondyle. Here would be the groove for where that ulna would normally sit. But if your arm is bent, that this little guy, the ulna will pull out. And so that what makes that sharp bone or feel when you bend your elbow. So it just pulls out and then it would be um, pulled toward the humerus by the bicep and brachialis. But the tricep connects here. So that's a really important landmark for it. And then let's just give the placement for the forearm. So remember the ulna would be here and then it's going to end, or I'm looking to end the wrist in line with the uh, top of the hip. 
So we can't forget all of these little proportion marks since now we've got so much invested with trying to think about all these muscles. But that's enough because I don't want you to get overwhelmed. I just want you thinking about one little piece or bite at a time and so today we're just trying to get that upper arm. Okay, so what is the part? The part for the tricep could be any number of things. Again, it's up to you in terms of how you ultimately want to stylize these little pieces to best fit or suit your memory. Everything in the arm is essentially a ball, um, but ways you could remember the tricep would be um, some people that I've studied with will say it looks like a lobster claw. So you could do like a ball, but then a claw. And I could explain why later. Um, I do something similar to what we did with the leg because your tricep is the same as your quadricep. So you do a ball, stand it on a house. And hopefully you remember this from the, the study of the, the leg. And then there's three commas that attach to it. One comma here. There's another comma that's a little bit lower. And then there's a tiny baby comma on the inside. The lobster claw idea is the same. It's just that when the muscles grab the tendon for a tricep, they often have like kind of a like a weird linear striation to them because they're grabbing onto the tendon, so it looks like a lobster claw. But I this is the one I tend to prefer because it maintains that idea of the threes, um, you know, one, two, three commas over the tendon. But I would always um, maybe start with something like this first, just a ball and a stick, tendon and a muscle shape, and then invest in the three parts when you get there or if you think you need it. In terms of proportion, it should be about two-third to one-third. Right, so it's going to be kind of mapping out where that proportion would be. Remember the idea of how muscles on asymmetrical forms work? If this flexes, or if it's used, which means it's going to straighten the arm, it'll move up. If it's relaxed, it'll move down. So let's lay this in. Let's get a basic idea for the shape and we'll give it a color so it stands out. So there's our egg. Color will be light blue. So here's the relative mass that we're trying to find or think about. And then I'll separate it more so into the overlaps that are important. Okay. So that's part placement. So here's the, the more specific um, idea for placement. Three heads, you have a long, a lateral, and a medial. The long is the inside one, the lateral is the outside one, so this shape is the same as this, and then the medial is the inside one, which is under the other two. The long head attaches, so remember we have here, teres major, let's go into the front still. You have this other one that I mentioned briefly, teres minor. They split teres major and minor and they leave a little triangle. That's where this tucks into. So in here you would see this. See, this is like the crease in the back of your armpit or like the pinch of your arm against the side of your rib cage. So that looks like this. And then you won't see these anymore because that teres major is going in front. So there's little tiny triangles like we're talking about, you know, here or here are so important for how the body fits together with some of these smaller areas being able to wedge into. The other one, the, long, the lateral head, goes up to the humerus. So it's under the deltoid, you're not going to see it, and then it comes down. 
the medial head you also don't see. It's kind of like the foundation that the other two are sitting on. So uh, I want to do, now that I have an idea of the placement, I've done the gesture, now I want to do the parts. So in starting the parts, I'm going to begin here. Big egg, I know where everything's going, more or less. Now let's maybe even use a center line. And I'm dropping that line down to the ulna. This is where it attaches. And so I'm going to make them stand on, uh, we could say, like a knife or a house, however you want to think of this. So let's say like that. And then I'm going to keep evident these bony surfaces. Remember, the tricep is the widest part of the arm in terms of muscle. So down here, I'm going to see all of these landmarks, and I want to preserve them. Now, parts would be showing the three. And so the three, if I show them here, would be the long head, which is the comma up here, is always higher. So like, if this is my house, I'm going to always maintain this curve or the asymmetry of this curve higher than all of the other heads. The long head shifts down a little bit further. So again, this is exactly like your quadricep. So now I have a high to low. Here's their split. All three of these muscles, long, lateral, medial, attach to the same tendon, this, this thing. That's the tendon, which is the exact same structure as your quadricep in the leg. Then the very last one is this. But it's an important one because you see this on the bottom of people's arms all the time. It's like a little um, wave. So I'll just make a last egg here that's asymmetrical to the lateral. So here's another asymmetry. And then that'll just be like a little overlapping hill. So let's give a better idea for the deltoid in this view. Here's the distal head wrapping to the outside. It's going to now cover all things tricep. So you're not going to see where any of these muscles attach at top. And then we'd have the medial head, which is going to just the acromion. So I'm going to try to bring out the landmark there a little bit more. And then I don't see the, dis the proximal head, which is the one in front. So this should be my perspective. So that is the tricep and how it looks from the back. Now because this is the widest part of the arm, I'm not going to see the brachialis and bicep, not from this view, if it's just a straight back view. Uh, lat also goes in front of this, so my overlap is showing the lat going uh, behind the blue shape of the tricep. Uh, let's take a look from the side view. So to draw in where the humerus is, here's the head of the humerus. We said that the humerus from the side kind of looks like a J. So a J meaning that, so you have head of the humerus here, bone or shaft of the bone is here, and then remember the humerus goes like this, kind of rolls forward, just like your knee does, but your knee goes back. So it looks like that. And then we would see the tricep here. So let's take this same color just for continuity. And I would be placing it in this area. Again, I'm shifting this mass higher because the arm, I'm imagining the arm is extended. So how would I reconcile the overlaps? This goes under your deltoid. So you do an overlap like this. And in this view, I'm now only seeing the lateral head. So lateral head looks like this. And then you'd have your tendon coming down. And that'd be grabbing the ulna. So from this view, you just see half. It's not entirely true because the long head is bigger. So it's, it's more common that you would see the long head coming around also in this view, but let's just keep it simple for now. You just see the lateral. So that's how that looks. So if this is active, this is a muscle that extends your arm. That means that the muscles that flex your arm, 
the bicep and brachialis are going to be relaxed. They're going to have an S curve to them. So, so far we have one shape. Out of the upper arm, we need two more. But remember that one shape, your tricep, so it's just for the sake of your notes, tricep, its job is to extend. And inside of that, you have three individual parts. And those parts are long, lateral, and medial. Inside, outside, under. How would that look from a front? Right, so then we already kind of did the back. Um, on this one, I could do the back and dimension, though. That might be useful. So let's go ahead and do this from a back view. OK, so most important thing here, if I'm giving this muscle some perspective, is to give it that box. The box is going to be built relative to where the anchor points of the bone are. So here's the medial epicondyle, the lateral epicondyle. And then I need to know now that this is the inside, that there is a perspective. You're not going to have a lot of success with the arms or the limbs in general if you can't see a side, back, front, top. So here's back, inside. Tricep only sits on the back. So that'll be here. Uh, we've been using you know, this singular template for the entire class, which is a female body. Females have a much less visible tricep because we've talked about that, or we talked about this. There's an additional fat pocket that sits over it. So it's softening like the rigid landmarks of the lobster claw or the house. Like you wouldn't get those as clearly in a female as you would in a male. In most cases, there's always exceptions. So now when I do this, the house can sit just in this back plane. So I'm designing it just to reference that plane, which means now I've hidden it and qualified the perspective at the same time, because now it substitutes for that box in an organic way. And then I'm going to think about adding the ulna, because that's what this tendon pulls on. So when you flex your tricep, it pulls on the ulna and pushes it, or brings it back into the pocket of the humerus. And then let's construct the three parts. This is the lateral head. That's a little bit lower. The long head, starting from the scapula. And I want that curve to be here, a little bit higher. There's a split. So that's a separation between the two. And I'm moving this line closer to this side because it's a symmetrical view. It's a symmetrical plane. So I want this one to look a little bit thinner. And then the medial head would be here. It's not on the side. It's just wider than the view. Right, so it would be going past it. And that's the tricep in this view. So big muscle, right? largest muscle for this portion of the arm. And then what I see it from the front, most definitely. right? So thinking about it here, again, just darkening the deltoid, it would be this. So it's the widest part of the arm, which means that you really see it from just about every view. But I'm only building it onto the back. So this would be the, later, the um, lateral, the outside and then the long head would probably be in you probably see that too like maybe in here somewhere okay so that is an extensor it's extending your arm or it's um, straightening it by pulling that ulna into the pocket of the humerus okay so I think we're still all right on time. I'm trying to keep these under 45 minutes. That's about what we would spend in class. I don't want to overwhelm you too much. So let's move into the, the last couple, last two. And that was, let's make these stand out. It's orange. Oh, we have that. So the next one is the brachialis. Again, that's Latin for humerus. 
and that's what it covers. So this is going to be a flexing muscle. So the tricep was extending, if that's the only muscle that's doing that, then you're having it working against muscles that flex. The muscles that flex the arm are the bicep weakly and the brachialis. So you have two to work against the tricep. Now, a good place to start would be from the side. So the brachialis is a pretty non-distinct shape. It's just a big egg. It's a pretty large muscle, primarily for how much it covers. So think of like, um, so you have your bone, and then think if you folded clay all the way around the bone minus the back. This muscle does that. It goes to the side, the outside, it goes to the front, it covers the inside of the arm. So it's a muscle that folds all the way around the front, inside, and outside. And so much so that it's described as the pillow muscle for the bicep. So it creates a bed or a pillow right around all of the sharp surfaces of the humerus, and then the bicep just kind of plops on top. So brachialis starts right where the deltoid ends. So if you can find that, this little tail, that's where the brachialis starts. It's going to go here, it's going to go to the front, it's going to go to the inside. And where it ends is the ulna. So let's say, we're not drawing the lower arms, but let's just say it's right here. That's the ulna. Here's what's important about it. When you draw it from the side, it's going to be an, an egg, but it has to go this way. It has to go forward. You can't bring it this way. And I'll explain why. Here it is. So this is the brachialis. We're just aiming it at the ulna. Here's the shape. Now the reason I need that to be moving forward is between that and the tricep, you need a triangle space. And that's where your forearm muscles start. So that's your, like, um, the big fatty muscles that you can feel opposite from your uh, funny bone on the outside of your arm, that big kind of, like, uh, soft mass, cylindrical mass that's on the outside of your elbow. That goes right in there. And if there's not a space left for it, then it's going to be difficult to make the arm feel believable. Right? So you have to leave that little triangle. So that's brachialis side with a landmark that you need to preserve. Don't see it here. Uh, I might see it a little bit, but I don't want to get too too crazy too soon, it would be here, and then front. Front view, find the deltoid, brachialis goes outside, front, inside, so all the way around. Design the egg, pull it forward, leave a triangle, and then this is going to the ulna, but the front of it. So it's kind of sweeping to the ulna, the placement of the ulna. So I'm just going to, actually it should be kind of towards the inside. So that's brachialis. Now thankfully we don't see a lot of this because the bicep covers what's on the front. Right, so let's bring this deltoid back a little bit, just darken it. So now you have the side, you have the back, you have the front three-quarter, and then when we add the bicep, we'll make a map for the just the straight-on front view. And let's do that now. So here's our front. We started with uh, kind of the straight on back view. So let's do a straight on front view. Here's my humerus. Here's the funny bone inside always, unless the arm's turned. Here's the lateral. Here's the ulna. And then radius would be thinner. 
So in this view, Brachialis starts halfway. And that's a it's an important thing because the Brachialis has a lower point of leverage. You know, mosuls generally attach at the top, and that gives them a higher vantage to pull, like a better point to pull from. This one's starting halfway down, which means it's powerful for beginning a movement, for starting the pull. But it can't finish. It doesn't have a high enough point to, to finish the pull of the arm. And so that's where the bicep comes in. And the bicep kind of just pulls the rest of the way. So that's brachialis. To give you the outline of where the tricep would be, the tricep is still wider than. So the front of your arm, when you're drawing it, if you're doing contour, is the back because this is still more narrow than that. And then this would be the lateral head, which again is always lower than the long head. So just keeping our asymmetries. The medial head would be here. And then the, again, the brachialis is thinner than both. So that's what we'd be thinking of or seeing with the front of the arm. So now, only last or only one left over is bicep, and bicep is something that again is always over developed in terms of a muscle. People get way too excited about it. It's thin. Its most important quality we've already talked about. It is uh, a muscle that supinates your hand. It's responsible for pulling the thumb outside or from the away from the center point of your body like your palms up so the bicep as a shape the primitive shape of the brachialis was an egg biceps also an egg it's just a higher egg so let's put it here it's a longer muscle it doesn't go as far down as the brachialis so let's put our egg here and this is roughly the placement of the bicep Remember the connection for the bicep is not to, uh, let's move it a little bit, looks a little weird there. So I'm going to put it just a little bit lower. But also I want to make sure I describe before adding it where the connections are. So it would be intuitive to think, oh, it goes to the head of the humerus, but it doesn't. It uses that though. So your bicep, and I wanted to also make it not symmetrical because it's not it has two heads, right? So here's the bicep shape, and then it's split in two. There's a long and a short head, and each one has its own tendon. So here, this tendon goes up, and then it fits over the head of the humerus. And then that tendon keeps going and grabs the scapula, which is this thing. So your bicep attaches to your shoulder blade. It doesn't attach to your humerus at all, not even the bottom. And then the long head, or the other head, attaches from that straight down. So it's kind of like suspended from those two. So that gives it a placement that isn't exactly um, consistent with the direction of the arm. And that was important, that's why I kind of started it over, because I've made a big point to try to get you all to see that muscles don't go with the bone. They always go against it or slightly across it. So here the bicep goes this way. And then it has two tendons when it ends. One that in a strange like modification of tendon goes out and then grabs the skin. It grabs the underside of your your dermis here. It's hard to see, so you don't always have to draw that one. The more noticeable tendon attaches to your radius, and that's what's supinating. So bicep ends here. Again, um, so there's a, to push our point for the importance of triangles, there's another triangle here. This is an empty space, and that's where the bicep dives down. So it kind of is dropping here as a muscle so that that tendon can flow into the radius over here. So think about the bottom is just, maybe just make a triangle for the tendon here because you don't need this one really. Just make that so that you have an idea of where it's moving. 
So that's going to the radius. Or if you want, you could make it just the incorporate the shape of the fossa, because that's the crook of the arm, kind of the bend of the arm. Let's color this in. So if you're designing the bicep, you're doing your homework and you're laying out your construction, the bicep's only on the front. That's all. It doesn't go anywhere else. So for this one, now if I'm trying to think about how this corresponds to perspectives, this line for the outside would match up with where the box is, it would sit on the corner. And then also notice how each time I've drawn a shape, it's thinner than the last one. So here's like, this is the th thickness of the bicep. It's sitting on top of the brachialis, which is a little bit wider. And then behind that, I could still see the tricep, which is the widest. This, I could probably move in because it's turned away, so I could foreshorten that better. But I still need to pull it down. And then brachialis would be in front. So this is why the arm gets tricky, is because this all turns, but the muscles are all pretty slight. So the box is really important just to help you kind of manage it all. Um, it's good to always also think about adding the deltoid back, because so much of the stuff I'm talking about gets covered. So like you really don't need to draw any of that. It's just what I'm drawing to help explain what I know is happening. So the front head comes under, the bicep would be going underneath the deltoid, so you'd see all of that kind of continue. I'll give a better definition for tendon. Tendon's going to be here. Medial head. Here's our triangle between the deltoid and the chest. And then the chest would be coming over the bicep like this. And so when you start to move from one part to another, I would just go back to your notes and double check what were the three parts of that area. It'll get complicated when you have all these things starting to kind of sit together. But just keep it to three. That's all that's happening. It's just that you have more areas of three sitting together. So that would be the front. Now let's try to add that to the, the front three-quarter. Let's take this shape. So I know it's starting here and that it is only on the front. So I can kind of see that in my box here. It's a stretched muscle in this case because it is passive. The uh, tricep has extended the arm, so I'm trying to pull this down to the idea where the radius would be. And then I'm just going to make the, the same design that I suggested that you try. Oh, chest has to be in front, bicep is under that, and then here let's end it in our fossa, because that's where it's overlapping. You're never really going to see it touch or attach to the the ulna, I mean sorry, the radius, so it's best to just kind of give it a an indication. So that's front, front three quarter. Any chance I'll see the bicep from the back? Very unlikely, so I don't have to worry about it too much there. So just a little bit of a darker outline here. This is the, the fossa, here's above that would be our funny bone. Brachialis is here. This is the triangle for where the ridge group of your forearm muscles would go. Tricep shape back here. And that's the three for the upper arm. And then, you know, you can see I'm starting to give three to the elbow too. So if you want to think about that now, you can. Your elbow has three shapes. From the front, it has the medial epicondyle, which is a, the triangle, the funny bone. It has this empty fossa, which we've used a lot today. And then on the outside is the lateral epicondyle, which is the curve. And then when we get to the forearm muscles, we'll just make that bigger. 
and that'll be the the transition of your ridge group. So those are your three shapes. So form. So the bicep has a, bit, a thickness. It's not that it's entirely weak and narrow as a muscle. It does have a corner. Now the brachialis is covered for you know except for the outside and inside. That would be its corner, and then the tricep is biggest. Don't see the bicep from the the back. We could cheat and maybe try to show a little bit. Something like that. And then let's do it for the front, or this is the side view. C curve, which means the bicep has to be an S curve. So I'm going to make, going up here, it's attaching. So I draw through the shoulder up there. Here's the muscle suspended in the middle. A little bit higher than the brachialis, but still I'm drawing it with an S curve. So if you were to bend the arm, like if we draw an arm that's flexed, we'd have to do the opposite in terms of gesture. The back of the tricep stretches and the mass of the whole pulls down towards the elbow and then the front of the arm, bicep and brachialis, will become C-curves or pinch and that's going to pull the forearm up. Right, so you'd have like something that looks like this. So S is now here C is now here. But we designed this first on the extended view. So S curve. And then that can just kind of fall into, you know, you could still add a little, like a thin triangle there if you want. So what we'll do next week is start to kind of pick up from here. Uh, think about how the, the elbow allows for the muscles of the forearm which I think needs its own week because it gets a little bit more difficult in terms of uh, maintaining everything and seeing those really small muscles. So if you are practicing or thinking about the, the muscles this week, it would be good to make sure you spend a lot of time on the perspective. And let's see, maybe this one. Maybe we could just check out what these muscles are doing on this pose that we had. All right, so if I'm looking at this guy, I'll try to add some of these that we just did. We'll just do this arm. So first step, or the most important step here, was that I first found the deltoid. That's like a, it's not easy, but it's the easiest thing, I think, to find. And it helps me because I'm now aware of where planes are. So it gives me a lot. Here's the middle head. And now I know that the only muscle that could be here is the brachialis. So that's this shape, like a little round shape here. And that stays on this plane. This is bending, so that's going to go up. And then see how this like fatty thing, that's attaching, that's what's attaching between brachialis and tricep. That's the ridge group. And that curve goes to your thumb. So that looks like this. The bicep, I only see turning away. So bicep would be on the front, which is over there. And maybe I only see like this much, but it's also flexed. So that's what bicep is doing. We had the tricep in blue, and you can see the tricep is stretched. So where's the tricep start? In between minor and major. So you have to put it behind that cigar shape. So it flows out of there. So you can see how it kind of like comes in like this. All the way in. It doesn't just attach to the outside. <coughs> Excuse me. That's coronavirus. And that's the problem with contour, right? Contour never gets there because it's always just assuming things can start begin and end on the outside which is, you know, the real disservice, especially if you're doing anything with 3D. So here's the S, comes out, it's all of this shape, but now that's moving further down. So now the shape, instead of being high and kind of compacted with a C-curve, 
it's getting longer and thinner. So you see how the curve is closer to the end of the elbow. And then the things we talked about with the elbow, funny bone, lateral, ulna sticking out between them. So that's when the, the elbow makes more of a triangular shape. So let's give some overlaps here. S-curve, that's the long head. Lateral is here. This could be the lobster claw or the, the sword shape, whatever you want to show for the tendon. Here's my split, my triangle, brachialis to tricep. Here's the funny bone, which is always in line with the lateral, so they have to be directly across. When the arm bends, the ulna comes out. And so that's why I have this, this shape. And that's going to the pinky. So that would be how you could start to incorporate some of what we're doing. Right? You just have to add, as long as you have the box set up, it should hopefully be just a matter of placing a volume on a plane and then describing how you think that mass has a gesture, like, like I'm showing here with S or C. And then the other side would be doing more or less the same. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I know the arm is, is a pretty difficult subject. So take it in parts. Uh, when we start, or when I start the next lecture, I'll do a few more of these kind of to give you some different views and ideas for how to show um, the, the rotation of the upper and lower arm. But that's it for, for this week. Um, and this is all stuff now that we've covered that you should add to your, um, your next homework assignment. If you have any questions or need feedback, individual meetings. You can always request them. Just let me know. Um, we can do Zoom or I can make recordings very easily like this for you guys. So hope everybody is well and healthy. Again, if you need any uh, help, just let me know.